Hello, and welcome to School to Homeschool. My name is Janae Daniels. I'm a wife, a mother of six, and a former middle school teacher turned homeschool mom. I have kids in their 20s, all the way down to elementary age, and everything in between. Are you thinking about pulling your kids from the public school system like I did, but you are scared to death and don't know what to do next? My friends, I felt the exact same way, and you have come to the right place. I want to help your family leave the system so that you can take the hearts and minds of your children back. Hello, my friends, and welcome back. I am very excited to introduce today's guest. I have wanted to have her on for a very long time. Um, I've mentioned her book many times in various episodes, and so I, it's an honor to have Carrie McDonald on. Now, for those of you new to the podcast, let me tell you who Carrie McDonald is. Carrie is a senior fellow and leader of the Education Entrepreneurship Lab at FEE, FEE, -E, and host of the Wiki weekly liberated podcast. She's the author of Unschooled, Raising Curious, Well-Educated Children Outside the Conventional Classroom. And in addition to her role at FEE, Carrie is also uh, the Valinda Johnson Family Education Fellow at State Policy Network, an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, and a regular Forbes contributor. Uh, so, her research interests include homeschooling and schooling alternatives, self-directed learning, education entrepreneurship, parent empowerment, school choice, and family and child po policy. Her articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the New York Post, Newsweek, NPR, Education Week, Reason Magazine, Washington Examiner, City Journal, Entrepreneur, and the Journal of School Choice, among others. She has a master's degree in education policy from Harvard University and a bachelor's degree in economics from Bowdoin College. Did I pronounce that right? You did, yes. Good, good, good. Uh, Carrie lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her husband and four children. Carrie, thank you so much for coming on today. It's great to be here, Janae. Thanks for inviting me. So when, for those of you new to the podcast, one of the things that I've shared in the past is that that first year of homeschooling, we gravitated towards the unschooling philosophy. And that's when towards that, somebody on Facebook mentioned, has, have any of you all read the book Unschooled by Carrie McDonald? And I thought, I have never read that book. I must get it. And I read it and was so inspired um, and felt like, yes, this, this is the direction we're going in. This Naturally, we were. So Carrie, thank you so much for sharing your book and your talents and, and inspiring us. Thank you. I'm gl again glad to be here to talk about this with your audience. So let's let's start with unschooled a little bit. Um, and and in the beginning of the book, you talk about your experience. If you could share a little bit about that and how it led you, because you were here getting your degree in education, and what happened? Yeah. So I was an economics major as an undergrad, as you mentioned, Janae, and fell in love with economics and realized through the course of that time um, that there was, you know, sort of begin asking this question of why do we have so much variety and abundance in so many aspects of our lives, but we have such limited choices when it comes to education. And as you sort of begin to think about that question, you realize that largely it's because education has historically uh, in the U.S. occurred kind of outside of the marketplace, sort of government-controlled, top-down, centralized system of schooling that most of us went through, that I went through. I went to K-12 public schools in suburban Boston, um, never really thought about another way of approaching education, never really questioned the sort of one-size-fits-all centralized pro approach to learning until sort of seeing it through the lens of economics. And so that is what led me to become more and more interested in education, mm -hmm. alternative education models, and school choice policies. Uh, it was really my senior year of college that I first discovered this idea of homeschooling. I was doing a research project for uh, a class I was taking and had an opportunity to shadow a homeschooling family that lived nearby and was just completely blown away by what I saw uh, in this homeschooling family, totally different from anything that I had experienced. Um, just this child who was very engaged, curious, self-directed, immersed authentically within her community and the people, places, and things around her. And it was quite a stark contrast to, again, not only 
what I had experienced as a student, but also what I was witnessing that same semester when I was doing a student teaching practicum in a local public elementary school with sort of the same age children as this particular homeschooler and seeing those classroom experiences side by side, I said, wow, this is just amazing to think that education can uh, and does look differently when we kind of take it beyond the four walls of a conventional classroom. So I was hooked from then on, went to graduate school in education policy, really became interested in um, in innovative models to education, always really uh, excited about homeschooling. And so when, you know, kind of fast forward a decade later, when I had my own children, um, I knew that I wanted to do something different for their education as well and began homeschooling them. Um, again, we live in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so sort of surrounded by, um, you know, many uh, opportunities and resources and museums and libraries. And I really felt like if I had sent them to the local public schools, their world would contract, or even to traditional private schools, their world would contract, that they would uh, sort of spend their days with the same kind of age segregated group of students that they would have the sort of handful of teachers versus what they were experiencing being fully immersed uh, in, again, the people and places and things around our city. So from that experience and connecting with local homeschoolers uh, in the city, really just fell in love with homeschooling now as a parent, not just sort of a researcher. And, um, and as my oldest was approaching kindergarten age, I started looking into kindergarten curriculum for her uh, and kind of had narrowed down various curriculum choices of, you know, um, products that would be, you know, very nurturing and very kind of project based, but that would definitely have a clear intent around what a child would learn and, and when and how. And as I was kind of narrowing down my curriculum choices, out of nowhere, my oldest learned to read. Uh, taught herself to read. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. And then <laughs> started kind of looking around at all the other amazing things that she was doing and looking at that compared to this curriculum that I was going to spend a significant chunk of money on to do the things that she was already doing on her own, following her own interests and curiosities. And so that's when I really discovered the philosophy of self-directed education, sometimes known as unschooling, in which a child's sort of natural curiosity drives their learning. And as adults, we are facilitating that, we're encouraging that, we're connecting our children to various resources, both community-based resources and increasingly digital resources to enable them um, to learn and grow, you know, in their own way. And so uh, I now have, well, <laughs> my, my children are now older. My, my oldest is now a, a senior, um, has always been homeschooled. Um, and then she, she's 17. And then I have a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, and a 10-year-old who all learned outside of a conventional classroom through self-directed education. I love it. Now, did you continue to homeschool or have you put them into an alternative education system? Yeah. So again, my oldest has always been homeschooled. Um, for high school, she began taking a, a suite of online classes. She just became really interested in um, in learning, you know, kind of a conventional high school curriculum, but she's always been legally homeschooled. Mm -hmm. um, everybody attended a self-directed micro school just about a mile away from our house a couple of days a week up until COVID. And then with COVID disruption, the micro school shut down for a long period of time. We had to look at kind of different options. And that's when I enrolled the, my three younger ones in the Sudbury Valley School, um, sort of the flagship self-directed school, Sudbury Model School that was founded in Framingham, Massachusetts in 1968 uh, and has inspired the growth of dozens of other Sudbury Model schools around the world. So they started going there um, in the spring of 2022 and mm -hmm. absolutely love it. Um, I, have, of course, have always known about Sudbury Valley. I wrote about it extensively in my unschooled book but never really considered it um, for my kids because it's, again, a 45-minute drive each way and because we had that self-directed learning center uh, walkable from our house. But like I think so many parents, including probably the parents that, that are in your audience, um, you know, COVID led to disruption for all of us and helped yeah. us to sort of start to think a little bit more about what else is available and, and maybe make some changes. Now, can you, for, for the listeners who are not familiar with the Sudbury Valley model, would you mind just sharing a little bit about that? 
Yeah. So again, it was founded in 1968. In the 1960s, there was um, a movement of free schools um, that were really not, they were free in sort of philosophy, but not in cost, although they were low cost in many ways, like today's micro schools, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, kind of highly personalized, flexible models, trying to reject kind of the standardized um, one size fits all model of tra- traditional schooling. And Sudbury Valley was part of that free school movement. And many free schools ended up fading in the 1970s. A lot of them kind of came about um, as part of the countercultural movement of the 1960s. But some um, endured and, like Sudbury Valley, expanded to, you know, again, inspire other schools to model their programs after them. So the real premise of Sudbury Valley and of self directed education more generally is. is is that um, it's sort of not a top-down, imposed, coercive curriculum that young people are granted um, freedom combined with responsibility, and they have the independence and autonomy to um, live their lives and approach their learning however they choose with adults there to provide support and to offer advice and guidance and, again, connect them to resources. Yes, I love that. Thank you. And I recently visited Alpine Valley School, which is a Sudbury Valley School in Denver just a couple of weeks ago. And it was really fascinating watching these kids and observing and and talking with the head of the school there. So, so fascinating. Now, let's talk a little bit about about micro schools, because that's that's something that you've you, you have a podcast about and the different various types of micro schools. Can you explain what a micro school is and how it is beneficial? for people. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that my my unschooled book came out in the spring of 2019, and it really talked about the growth and diversification of the homeschooling movement um, through the first two decades of the new millennium, as well as the emerging micro school movement. And I was looking specifically at micro schools and learning communities that focused around this idea of self-directed education, um, but was also talking about micro schools more generally, that we started to see these sort of intentional small, highly personalized, often flexible learning communities, uh, typically mixed age, so a sort of a modern version of a one-room schoolhouse starting to um, come on the scene really in the kind of early 2010s and so, and beyond. And so mm-hmm. uh, fast forward a year after my book came out, it was the spring of 2020, and all of a sudden, um, you know, families were living side by side alongside their children during school closures and prolonged remote learning. And we started to see that summer the emergence of pandemic pods, which were, again, these sort of spontaneous parent-driven learning communities. And many of those pods um, evolved into micro schools. Again, are these sort of intentionally small, highly individualized, highly personalized, flexible, mixed age learning communities. And we're just continuing to see that growth. So these aren't new. Um, you know, hybrid homeschool programs have been around since the early to mid 1990s. Micro schools, sort of self directed micro schools, like I wrote about in Unschooled, have been around also since uh, at least the mid 1990s. We saw in 2009 the um, introduction of Acton Academy. Again, some of your listeners and viewers might be familiar with Acton, but founded in 2009 as a learner-driven microschool that now has over 300 schools around the world serving thousands of learners. So I think what really happened in the wake of school closures and remote learning during COVID was that more parents became interested in different ways of approaching teaching and learning, sort of started to wonder what else was available as they, um, you know, maybe their local school was closed for a long period of time and they started to look around and say, what else is there? And then they discovered this whole world of homeschooling and microschooling and hybrid school and um, high quality online learning platforms that were quite different from the Zoom school that maybe their children were experiencing during COVID. And they started to demand more of these options, more of this abundance and variety in education that they were experiencing elsewhere in their lives. And then we had more of these everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial parents and teachers go off and build more of these models. I love it. Now, one of the the things that I often hear from my listeners, and I felt this as well, is like, okay, what if, if because you know, if I pull my kids from the traditional school system, they're not going to be successful. Um, they're not going to make it in the real world. How do you address um, 
when you talk to people who are in the system and when you talk to these families that are coming out of the system, what are some of the things that you share with them? Can they be successful? And what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, again, you know, homeschooling is not new. Microschooling is not new. So we have a lot of um, kind of generations at this point of learners who have learned in alternative ways and are and are doing quite well. Um, and especially if you compare it in many cases to traditional public schools and look at the test scores, for example, of students in 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 public schools, um, you know, they're not necessarily thriving very well either. So um, it's a, it's obvious that parents would be looking for something beyond that kind of standardized one size fits all classroom and looking to alternative. So over the years, we have numerous peer-reviewed studies that show that homeschoolers in particular um, are able to live, you know, high quality lives. They're able to go to college should they choose. They're able to be successful there. Um, in terms of Sudbury model schooling, there's been, again, numerous peer-reviewed studies of alumni of Sudbury schools um, and finding that they also are able to go on to college and live, again, successful, meaningful lives. And in the case of Sudbury schools and unschooling or self-directed models more generally, we find a high number of learners become entrepreneurs, um, mm -hmm. often developed developing businesses around interests that emerge during childhood and adolescence because they were able to have that time to commit to really pursuing their passions. Another, you know, piece of um, data that might be helpful is um, the ACT, the standardized test, one of the standardized tests that um, students can choose to take if they are interested in uh, um, attending college, although most colleges are test optional these days. But if they want to take the ACT or the SAT, the ACT is um, one option there. And since 2001, the ACT has been keeping data around the students completing those tests, finding that homeschoolers and private school students um, have performed far above public school students on the ACT since 2001. I love that. Now, for those, because I, I, I personally have received criticism from people in my world, especially from very traditional school at home, homeschoolers, um, that, well, children can't just naturally learn how to read. And there's some kids that will, you know, that are going to struggle and are, are never going to learn if, if you don't show them something. How would you respond to that? Well, a couple of things. One of the things that I say very clearly in Unschooled and I truly believed is that um, parents uh, have the obligation to make certain that their children are highly literate and numerate. And I would say that that's true of homeschooling parents just mm -hmm. as much as it's true of parents whose students are in a conventional school, um, that it's up to the parents to make sure that your children are learning and, and that they're learning in a way that is aligned with your parenting philosophy, your values, your viewpoints. I think, again, that's what we're seeing seeing today as education becomes much more decentralized, becomes much more choice enabled, that parents are finally able to select the kind of education that really matches their preferences and values. So that's sort of the first thing I would say. The second thing that I would say is that, you know, if you if you read the stories in Unschooled, you'll find that, um, you know, many students are able to read on their own, that often what happens and what's been happening even more so since the No Child Left Behind Act was passed in 2001, the federal legislation that sort of created the pathway for common core curriculum standards and frequent standardized testing in schools, what that's done is really push um, expectations around reading to ever younger ages. So there was an interesting study done by researchers at the University of Virginia where they asked kindergarten teachers in 1998, you know, what percentage, uh, they asked, you know, what, what, what do you think that, that students should be reading by the end of kindergarten? And in 1998, only about 30% of kindergarten teachers said that, yes, five-year-olds, kindergartners should be reading by the end of kindergarten. Fast forward 12 years later to 2010, um, after, again, the rollout of No Child Left Behind, now more than 80% of teachers saying that kindergartners should be reading. So what mm. happened during that time? The, the right. kids didn't change, right? The five-year-olds are still five-year-olds. What happened was the benchmark changed. And so mm. I think it's just something to be aware of for parents that that we may be pushing 
in this case, reading, but we could talk about other examples too, but pushing um, reading standards down to, you know, four and five-year-olds that we just historically didn't do and pushing them to do something that they may not be developmentally ready for. And then saying, oh, look, my kid can't read when in fact, it's just, they're just not quite ready to read. And there's been studies done that I cite in Unschooled of children, uh, especially there's a great study done in the UK of children who've learned outside of a conventional classroom in these sort of homeschooling environments. And they find that the sort of average age of, of reading proficiency uh, among these children who learn outside of a conventional classroom is around eight years old. Um, that's sort of the, if we think of a bell curve of reading proficiency, some will be really early readers, some will be later readers, and most are learning around eight years old. And so uh, I think it's just being more open to different ways of, of thinking about child development. We sort of recognize, for example, that children will you know, walk and crawl at different ages, that they'll assume language at different stages. And we're okay with that. But when it comes to reading, I think increasingly we're putting kids in a box that, that may not be right for them. I would agree. Well, and I, I look at my own daughter and I had helped her with phonics and, you know, again and again, and she, it didn't click. It didn't click. And she's now eight. And last year it clicked, you know, and she went, oh, I, I get it, you know. And so I, I've seen that with my, with my, caboose, you know? So as far as like, um, one of my, and, and I'd love to, for you to talk about this a little bit, because I know that you're, you're heavily involved, um, in, in the political side of things, especially as you talk about micro schools and, and things like that. Um, what are, what do you believe will be some of the challenges that homeschoolers and potentially schools like Sudbury Valley will face with, um, as the government sees more and more families leaving to homeschool, how is that going to affect regulation? I know this is being very presumptuous, but I'd love to get your take on that and what what you see on your side coming. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. I think that we always have to be vigilant as families and as founders of new schools and spaces to encroaching regulations. We have to be aware that it's a possibility. We have to push back on it. I think I take comfort in data showing that homeschool you know, numbers have climbed, of course, over the past couple of decades. Current numbers around homeschooling hovers around 6% of all school-age children, over 3.5 three million uh, U.S. school children now homeschooled in the U.S. That's kind of on par with charter schoolers, which is about 7%, and um, private school students, which is about 11%, according, again, to the most recent Census Bureau data. So homeschooling numbers have climbed, and yet, and school choice programs that enable education funding to follow families has, has, has also climbed, including programs that homeschoolers are in some states eligible for. And yet what we've seen over that same period of time that homeschooling has grown and school choice programs have go grown homeschooling has become more deregulated over the past couple of decades. So I think we can take some comfort in that. And again, be weary um, of the potential of of encroaching regulation, but also acknowledge that that it's not um, a certainty and that the more homeschoolers there are and the more private schoolers there are, more micro schools, um, the more it will be difficult for regulation to clamp down on some of those programs. I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, we see, for example, with Uber and Lyft um, coming into cities to kind of disrupt the taxi status quo. Um, <laughs> there were efforts and there continue to be efforts to kind of clamp down on um, on ride sharing apps in various cities. But I think the reality is we're at a point where there's so many people who like, the, for ex in this case, Uber and Lyft, that it's hard for, um, you know, sort of the traditional uh, taxi lobby or, or other, um, you know, politicians to clamp down on innovation because it's so pervasive. And I think that's the moment we're at now that there are so many families looking for options beyond a conventional um, district school. And there's so many founders building those options that um, I think we'll be able to keep regulation at bay. Love it. Now, as far as with, with micro schools, a couple questions. First, what I want to know some of the challenges of micro schools and then kind of in the same vein, but switching gears slightly, um, how, how can families find local micro schools, you know, 
where they can send their kids. Yeah. Um, so, so microschools, I'll, I'll just maybe clarify, and you kind of asked me this before, but maybe uh, it's worth clarifying more is sort of microschools typically can either be homeschooling collaboratives for families. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, the microschools my kids attended before COVID was an example of this, where the program itself was set up as sort of a learning center for homeschoolers, but you could attend up to five days a week as a full-time schooling alternative for a fraction of the cost of a traditional private school. You could also choose, as we did, part-time options um, and then homeschooling the rest of the time at home. It's similar with hybrid homeschool programs, which again are drop-off programs. Um, that you typically meet on campus two to three days a week, and then the rest of the time is at home. And then you have some micro schools today uh, and some hybrid schools today that are registered private schools um, that, again, are offering sometimes flexible enrollment if they're able to or separate programs for homeschoolers. So there's really a blend. Uh, often that depends on state and local regulations around homeschooling or private schooling. You'll see in some states, for example, it might be more difficult to start a private school, so a found there might open a homeschool learning center and vice versa. Um, and those are the kinds of regulations and sort of state entrepreneurial barriers to entry and scale that I do think we should be working on. I'm more concerned about those kinds of barriers than I am about anybody sort of cracking down on homeschooling mm -hmm. freedoms. Um, but we should be, you know, very cognizant of both. Um, and so in terms of where to find these, you know, there are some organizations that I think are trying to create more of a, of a centralized um, national database or directory for models, but it's not easy to do, right? A lot of these emerging schools and spaces are so dynamic. They're um, being created at kind of a very grassroots level, often under the radar, that, uh, you know, sort of a centralized platform or an ed tech company um, kind of working at a high level, national level, I just don't think they're going to be able to capture all of the magic that's happening in local communities. So I'd suggest sort of two things. First, looking at grassroots um, school directories and organizations that are working in certain communities. I think of, for example, South Florida is um, a hub of education, entrepreneurship, and innovation in the three largest counties of South Florida. There's over 120 of these innovative learning environments, uh, micro schools and homeschooling collaboratives and low-cost private schools serving about 10,000 students every year. And there's a wonderful grassroots nonprofit organization called the Innovative Educators Network work, which was just put together by some entrepreneurial teachers who were running micro schools and homeschooling programs and wanted to bring other founders together and help families figure out what's right for them. So that's a great group. There's another similar group again in Florida called microschoolflorida.com, which is looking specifically at um, schools and spaces in Florida. So the more local that um, the resources are, the better quality, the more reliable the information will be. And then in the absence of that, I think Facebook. <laughs> I think yeah. that going onto Facebook um, and, and searching or posting in homeschooling groups, parenting groups, local education groups that are related to your local geographic area is the best way to go. You can even post anonymously, um, you know, if you're unsure what to say or if you're in the right place. But that's often a place to go and kind of ask questions, what's available. And I find, and I'd be curious what you say, Janae, but I find more often than not, families are able to either be directed to a different home, a Facebook group that might help them, or they're able to, get to, you know, kind of gather the information they need about local micro schools and co-ops and other kinds of schools. Well, I know, I know for me, that's how I've found stuff personally yeah. as I've, you know, cause I do have, I have one child that goes to a, a, a forest school one day a week and another child that goes to an aeronautical engineering, um, enrichment program once a week. And I found it on Facebook cause I couldn't find anything centralized. And at the beginning I was like, no, we need something centralized. And like, except for that's what we have with the public school system. And that has not done us any justice, you know? And so, um, but it was through just through faith. I mean, that's how I found your book too, was on Facebook. So, um, no, I, I absolutely agree. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about, uh, your, your new book coming out and if it's coming out 2025, yes. yes. Do you, do you have the release date yet? I guess it, you've got 
Yes, the book will be on bookstore shelves in August of 2025, right around kind of back to school season. It's at the publisher now. So Yay. it really, um, you know, kind of captures a lot of the changes that I've seen, I've been documenting um, and writing about and speaking about since 2020. Mm -hmm. um, looking at this diversity of models and methods of schools and spaces that have not only emerged, but I think really um, accelerated since 2020 in the education disruption. And so it's really looking at this wide variety, wide diversity of models so that families really are able to choose what they want um, more so than ever before. I love it. And that book is Public Affairs, correct? The publisher is Public Affairs, okay. which is an imprint of Hachette, one of the big five publishing houses. Okay, and gotcha. I can I can tell you the the title. Um, it's Joyful Learning, and so it'll be really focused on these schools and spaces that are um, creating, you know, these enriching, nurturing environments for children, again, all kinds of different philosophies. So whereas Unschooled really just focused on self-directed education, um, this is much broader than that, but still mm -hmm. very much focused on individualized learning and really putting students ahead of systems. I love it. I'm very excited. And sorry about that. I thought that was the name of the book. So um, Joyful Learning coming out in August. Now, Carrie, last... Um, last words or advice that you'd give to new homeschooling moms or moms that are about to pull their kids from the system, what would you tell them? It's never been a, a better time to be a homeschool parent or a homeschooled student. There are so many homeschoolers now. I'm just blown away even since my oldest daughter was born in 2006 and is again now in her senior year of homeschooling, just seeing um, the growth in homeschooling, all of the various resources available to homeschoolers now, the accessibility of homeschooling, homeschooling across the U.S., um, it's really a, a mainstream option um, that provides so much flexibility and freedom for families. And so that's really exciting. I would say, I guess my biggest piece of advice is to connect with um, community, right? So find your homeschooling community. That could be, as we talked about, Janae, you know, through Facebook groups, that are related to homeschooling, finding the spaces where you feel like you really fit in. It could be um, shopping around to different homeschool classes or micro school programs to find the folks that you really connect with. And then building that community and that connection there that, um, again, there's just so much more opportunity now than there ever was. I love it. Thank you. Y'all, if you have not read Unschooled by Carrie McDonald, pick it up today. It's so good. I'm going to put uh, the links in the bio in the show notes um, if you want to pick up that book. Um, Carrie, thank you so, so much for taking the time with us today. Mamas and papas, you're doing better than you think you are. Grandmas and grandpas, you got this. We'll talk next week. If you enjoyed this today, please like and subscribe. You could also join our private Facebook group at School to Homeschool or sign up for our newsletter at www.schooltohomeschool. Have a great day.